and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. Yes, it is Friday. I'm happy for that. The Kings have a do-or-die game tonight. <laughs> Sinead, I know you're happy about your OT winner for the Blackhawks. It was but incredible. It was incredible, you guys. We stuck it out. Double overtime. We, we got through it together. It was amazing. amazing. How many uh, donuts did you consume in the game-watching process? I couldn't, I couldn't even speak, let alone eat anything. I literally, I told Dennis I did like the bob. Like, I kept sitting <laughs> down and standing up, like, simultaneously for, like, 30 minutes. It was stress, you guys. Sounds it was, intimidating. It was I, uh, insane. I, I'm very well nourished during Spurs games, usually because they're up by 30. Uh, <laughs> you know what's really exciting? You know what the biggest sports matchup of today is, though? Is it right now, somewhere in a cage far below our Southern California studios, are Finstock and Ooh. Schnepp. We're not feeding them. We're not. We're just. We're just giving them straight <laughs> coffee. They're going to be full of energy later on today. That takes place on your YouTube channel here at Collider at 2 p.m. PST. It's going to get wacky, guys. Awesome. I know you just gave an entire introduction, but I do want to say your name. It's Mark Ellis. Oh. And also here today <laughs> joining us is Clark Wolf. Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, before we get into our regularly scheduled program, two things kind of hit before we started the show. First thing up is, I guess, The Rock confirmed on Twitter that he is going to be part of the Jumanji reboot. We talked about this earlier this week about him and Kevin Hart. I, I think in the tweet it didn't say anything about Kevin Hart, but... Mark, what do you think about The Rock being part of this? Well, it's what we were talking about earlier this week, too, is that the movie's going to happen with those two stars as long as they can get their schedules clear. So I guess The Rock was the first one to be like, <laughs> okay, I found two weeks to shoot this movie. <laughs> now we just need to get Kevin Hart to get his schedule clear. I think with The Rock doing so today, I think that paves the way for Kevin Hart to be in the movie as well because they have the Central Intelligence movie coming out together. It looks hilarious so far. Haven't seen the movie yet. Um, this is this is cool to me. I was I never grew up like caring that much about Jumanji. Mm -hmm. I love Loved Robin Williams. I saw the movie was out. I saw it was a thing. Just didn't really glom onto it. But I love the concept. And with today's modern effects, you can make the board game look so. Uh, it, it, you can really immerse yourself in that world. And The Rock, look, the guy's got a lot of charm. He's got a lot of charisma. He can certainly pull off action and comedy. So sure, why not? Clark, are you excited about The Rock being part of the Jumanji reboot? I'm excited about The Rock doing anything, <laughs> to be honest with you. I love The Rock. Uh, and, uh, you know, look, he he has the nickname of Franchise Viagra yeah. for a reason. Um, you can't think, I can't think of a more sure bet than The Rock right now. And um, I also think it's really cool how he is sort of spanning um, all different kinds of movies, whether it's the hard R, raunchy Baywatch movies, whether it's, or the kids movies, where, you know, he actually kind of, his first couple of roles were and more family-friendly films. So I think that um, he's going to be a great fit for this franchise. And uh, and hopefully Kevin Hart will sign on too. And I definitely was a Jumanji kid. I had the picture book and then I saw the movie and then I had the board game. And I think it's great. I'm really excited. And I, I don't, I, it sounds to me too like with this casting, they're sort of revamping the story in a way. So I don't think it's going to um, uh, be kind of a direct remake. So um, So yeah, I think it'll be great. How was the actual board game? They had a real board game. It was fun. Game. Was it? Yeah, and it had Were the you little... Were terrified to play it? No. <laughs> I, I always wanted the animals to come out of the board game. Like, you know, I love scary things. I yeah. want the thing to I would play away. a Jumanji board. Ouija, I'm not, I never touch a Ouija. I have never touched a Ouija board. No. I will never touch a Ouija board. But a Jumanji board, I'd totally be on board with. <laughs> on board with a right. Jumanji board. All right, so the other piece of news that dropped is a new Independence Resurgent. Is that what it's called now? Independence Day like, Resurgent. Yeah, they have like a five million name. So yeah. another new trailer came out. I know Clark is excited to talk about this one. So Clark, you start it off. Oh, okay, I sure will. Um, last time I was on Movie Talk and we were talking about this uh, and we saw, I think, the posters or something. I, I said I love Independence Day and I love Independence Day. <laughs> like this is seriously one of my favorite movies ever. Oh, if you guys watch the showdown, you know that uh, I won my round on an Independence Day question. Captain Stephen Hiller, thank you very much. Um, so so when I, we watched this trailer just now, I was just like, oh my gosh, I couldn't contain myself. And uh, I think the trailer looks great. I think, you know, look, we, um, we talk about the scope and the scale of action adventure movies all the time. You know, it's, it's not anything new to see the world in complete upheaval, 
but I love the effects that they had in this. I love the visuals here. And I think that it really felt like a continuation of the story and capturing the tone of the first movie, which is what I love the most about it. I think it's fun, it has humor, and has heart, which I like. And I like that it seems like the message is we all as people need to unite. And I think that's a hopeful thing. So I'm on board, I cannot wait. Well, I really like this trailer. I can't be a quite as enthusiastic <laughs> about it as you. I, I'm looking forward to it. I think the thing that I noticed was this was like all new footage. Yeah. A lot of stuff we hadn't seen before. Great spectacle. I, I, people always compare Roland Emmerich to Michael Bay. I think I have a lot more fun with Roland Emmerich's films. I think he has... It is definitely over the top and silly, but I think he has more fun with it than Michael Bay, where it's, it's much more serious. The one thing I didn't care for in this trailer, though, is the focus on the younger actors mm. with Liam Hemsworth and then the guy that's playing Will Smith's character's son and then Bill Pullman's daughter. I, I, all their lines kind of felt flat to me. They're like, oh, there's going to be some fireworks or whatever the hell he says. <laughs> but like, that's the Will Smith line. Yeah, that's but, the line but from Will the first Smith can, one. Will Smith can deliver well, that line. All right, I'm sorry in that that trailer just it fell flat for me but everything else I, i'm on board for well Alice. dennis if you don't like the young people in this movie i have some bad news for you this trailer <laughs> uh, looks like all the old people are gonna die yeah like, uh, i think yeah. everybody's eating it in this movie i think judd <laughs> hirsch is gone i think bill pullman's gone jeff goldblum you may want to go ahead and, and and get your will in order i mean i don't know that a lot of these people are going to make it out of this film alive i don't know that humanity is going to survive this movie how do we beat the aliens i love that we have user technology because they mentioned that in the first trailer like mm -hmm. oh we've learned from their technology and it's like well what did you learn just to get like a better firewall than what they had in the first movie <laughs> no they have spaceships we have all this cool looking stuff and we still are not prepared for what the aliens going to be bringing to the party this time i loved everything about this trailer like clark i love independence day it is such stupid silly fun to me i can't wait to go back to the theater and see this movie so do the aliens now have like a thunderbolt port in, in their ship so they can connect your oh, MacBook absolutely Pro yeah the aliens are coming back and they're bringing apple products guys <laughs> <laughs> Look out. Sinead, what did you think of this trailer? I loved it. I think it looks absolutely fantastic, action-packed, and it's like a hot mess in a very clean way. Like, <laughs> it's very well put together, and the trailer is very well put together, but I will say there was a lot of emphasis on the younger um, actors in this, yeah. and that's obviously because they're trying to... You know, they're trying to start a new Boo. Independence Day generation. Well, because they're killing their parents. <laughs> I want to see Jeff Goldblum, Bill Pullman, and Brent Spiner. I don't well, want to see these new Brent kids. Brent Spiner making it out of the movie. People yeah. are getting old, Dennis. we got to make so, way. So I have a question for you guys. Um, I When they first announced that they were doing this, I, I thought I heard that they said that they were going to do them back to back. Like this was going to be two movies. Um, do we know? Did that happen? Like did they shoot know. a second movie already? I can't imagine that took place. Okay. I think you got to see what the so. temperature is with this movie. And you know, Dennis, you brought up the word spectacle. I was surprised at just how big of a spectacle this is. All the destruction that's going on. Like, they take all of our stuff and lift it up with their own gravity. Then they throw it back in our face. So like, awesome. this thing is going to get messy. <laughs> but it's not anything I take seriously because no. Emmerich, I think, gets the tone. He, he, he lands the sense of humor so much better than Michael Bay does in these kind of movies. That's one of the attractions for Independence Day for me. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's start with our first topic. Just as it was, it was announced that Robert Downey Jr. would be joining Tom Holland in Spider-Man Homecoming, Deadline dropped the news that Michael Keaton would no longer be a part of the movie. The actor was announced last week as in discussions to play the villain in the movie, with many reports speculating that it would be as Vulture, one of Spider-Man's arch enemies. The report gave no reason as to why Keaton left the role, adding that the two studios are back to the drawing board, searching for another actor to take on the villain role. Spider-Man Homecoming will be directed by John Watts and is scheduled to hit theaters on July 7, 2017. Dennis, what are your thoughts on losing Michael Keaton as the villain in Spider-Man Homecoming? I'm actually quite disappointed. Uh, I love this Michael Keaton resurgence that we're having with Spotlight and Birdman. He even showed up in, what, Need for Speed and RoboCop. He kind of disappeared for a while. The reason why I'm so disappointed is that Vulture, to me, is not a villain that I was really that interested in seeing. But once the rumors were, were about Michael Keaton playing that, I was like, okay, I'm much more interested now. And now he's dropping out, so I don't know if they're going to replace him with someone else or go with a different villain. I don't know. Um, else? Yeah, I'm, I'm shocked at how much I don't care about this story because I love Michael Keaton. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. And so you put him in Spider-Man, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And now that he's gone, I'm like, okay, we'll be fine. We're going to be fine. Maybe part of my judgment is being clouded by how much I saw 
and love Spider-Man in Civil War. Yeah. So like anything, yeah, guys. That you, fi I, you finally saw it. I still haven't seen it. Oh, you guys. Here, here's what happened. Oh, no. um, <laughs> Spider-Man is one of the best parts of a fantastic movie. And so any movie I get to see him in in the future, I'm sold on. I don't care who the villain is. I don't care who's playing the villain. Just give me a lot of Spider-Man. Obviously, I want to see a high caliber actor being the role of Vulture, if that's who we're still going with, which I think they will still go with that. It seems like that's the story that they want to tell. They want to give a different spin on Spider-Man, show us a new villain that we haven't yet seen in a movie. So that's who they're going to go with, in my opinion. If Michael Keaton's not going to be the guy, I'm going to be fine with somebody else. Did you see the Facebook post I posted about you watching Civil War? Uh, no, I'll about, look at it right about, now. About how the worst part of you seeing Civil War is that me and John Schnapp can't make fun of you anymore. <laughs> can't it lord a, it over you. It was a long two weeks, and I know you guys have a few weeks left, but trust me, me it's all going to be worth I'm it. I'm with you guys. I still haven't well, seen it. Well, now I'm jealous of you because you get to see it for the very first yeah, time. Yeah, that's cute. That, <laughs> good try. Good try, Ellis. So what do, you, what do you think about Michael Keaton dropping out? I think this is a drag. I think it's a big bummer. Um, you know, however, I will say last time I was here on Movie Talk, we were talking about this news and um, I didn't say it then, but in the back of my head, part <laughs> of me was like, is this really going to happen? Um, and I think it's because Keaton was pretty gun shy after Batman. I mean, I think it's well documented that that fame and attention and the uh, universe like took a toll on him and so um, there was part of me that was like wow that's very interesting that he would kind of get back into the superhero game and it's looking like he didn't so I think that's a drag and um, unfortunate but I like you Mark I think that you know they'll find somebody just as awesome probably to fill the role but I would have liked to see to have seen Keaton do we, it and Riley and I were talking about this yesterday when the news first broke that Keaton not only is the part of this but he also left Skull Island. And yeah, so okay. I just wonder if he's one of these guys who says, yeah, I really like what that project could be. And then maybe once he gets a script, it doesn't jive with him, or he gets another offer for a smaller movie because I think Michael Keaton is somebody who deserves an Oscar. Every time the guy steps in front of a camera, he's a threat to get nominated for an award. So maybe he's looking for more source material that can provide that as opposed to be in another big budget blockbuster movie. Like Clark pointed out, he's already been down that road. And by the way, if I may, I, uh, I love love Robert Downey Jr. I think he is one of the most talented actors of his generation, um, especially pre-Iron Man. Not to say he's not doing great things in that currently in his blockbusters, but blockbusters. Like, you know, like the idea is he, uh, Downey could have easily said, look, I'm Iron Man. I got the money. I got Sherlock Holmes. I got these franchises. I'm going to do these small movies that offer these um, more a little more challenging, uh, dramatic parts. And because I think Downey should have an Oscar. Um, and so, you know, I wish that he would sort of follow suit because I agree with you, Mark. I think that's exactly what Michael Keaton's But doing. he did try yeah. to strike out with uh, The Judge. But that, yes. under uh, You know, that was under his production company, him and his wife's. And then he, he, I think that's what he was going for. And I think the box office disappointment that was kind of set him back it was like oh maybe i should go back well to doing i would say that the judge is not spotlight no do you know right. what i mean he and also i had think the soloist too where i, I think he, he has done those movies and maybe because he's done those movies and they haven't gotten the critical or the box office receipts that he wanted maybe that's why he's more reticent to leave the Iron Man suit behind. I, I guess what I'm sort of saying is that I want to see him go back to a guide to recognizing your saints, or mm. the singing detective, or um, um, kiss kiss bang bang. You know, movies that have five million dollar budgets, mm -hmm. movies that are clearly labors of love, or have a unique story to tell, and not Oscar bait. Because I'm sorry, the judge and the soloist both. Mm are Oscar bait. And anytime you look like you're asking for an Oscar, probably not the best idea. Are you the only other person besides myself that has seen Guide to Recognizing Your yeah, Saints? Yeah, I have, because I love Downey. Well, Downey well was he's my... good in it, but you know who's actually... Uh, Shia LaBeouf. Yeah, he's amazing yeah, in it. People, wow. people don't think that he can act. It's like, go watch that movie. I, I, yes, I agree with you. And I, for a while, Downey was my favorite working actor because he was doing these weird, challenging kinds of things, smaller things. Mm -hmm. And I like the big stuff too, but you know, about Balance. Sinead, uh, does Michael Keaton dropping out, does that kind of dull your anticipation <laughs> for, for Spider-Man? There's a bug. I'm sorry okay. if I look like I'm losing my mind. I'm like, 
Um, yeah, I think that this is a very normal thing that happens on movies, though. You know, there's a lot of negotiations that go that we as audience members don't hear about. It's just more of a bummer because we heard about this one and Michael Keaton is a G and amazing. Mm. And so we're like, oh, he would have been great. But I think that they go through a list of actors and this is just part of the process. Negotiations have to be made. And if Michael Keaton and his team can't agree, then that's what it is. And they move on. I think that this entire thing could have happened under the radar and we wouldn't have known, and it would have been totally fine either way. I think Michael Keaton will appreciate you calling him a G. He is a G. <laughs> yeah. Such a G. <laughs> All right, what's next? Fans hoping to see Game of Thrones, Amelia Clark reprise the role of Sarah Connor moving forward after last year's Terminator Genesis. Prepare to be disappointed. In a short interview with ComingSoon.net, Clark was asked about reprising her role in future Terminator movies, and her answer was short and to the point. No. Can I say that? It's okay. No. Uh-huh, but I have some very different roles coming up. Her comments now add another question mark for the future of the Terminator series after Genesis flopped at the domestic box office last year, earning only $89 million and $440 million worldwide, despite being intended as a soft reboot of the franchise. In January, Paramount took the proposed sequel to Genesis off the release schedule entirely. Mark, what do you think about Amelia Clark not portraying Sarah Connor anymore? Smart move, Khaleesi. It's the right play for you as an actress. You just get out of a franchise that seems to be doomed. They just cannot get this thing right. You don't need to be Sarah Connor again. I thought she was fine as Sarah Connor. I didn't think she was great as Sarah Connor, but the movie was not good. I was very upset leaving the theater because I thought it would be a nice reboot of Terminator and we could finally start telling cool stories again. That was not the case, so I'm glad she jumped ship. Uh, I cannot do the joke justice, but last night on the Schmoes No Live show, Ken Knapsack, when he does the news, had the best joke I've ever heard about this Terminator situation, so check that out. I can't I can't speak on it anymore. I'm glad she's not in it. Clark? Um, So, look, I am not going to lie to you guys. I didn't all caps hate Terminator Genesis. Neither did I. Okay. So, it's, you know, I'm not saying it's great, but I also didn't think it was the worst thing I've ever seen. However, the parts that I thought were cool had nothing to do with the humans. I liked Mm -hmm. every time Terminators were on the screen. Uh, Jason Clark, I mean, spoiler alert, guys. He's a Terminator, but um, <laughs> Jason Clark is uh, is I loved him. I thought he was great. I, I whatever, and him and Arnold together, fun, cool. Uh, but the people, oh, awful. Um, and, and but that's not their fault. This mm-hmm. is the thing: is I felt like with an actress like Amelia Clark, you know, taking on this iconic role of Sarah Connor, you know, look, they, you're she's never going to be Linda Hamilton, and so it's kind of like and and the fact that they had her in sort of the. 80s garb with the hair and the and trying she didn't look like her it was very confusing so I think it's for the best it's definitely a smart move and you know hopefully the folks behind Terminator can maybe give it another shot maybe on TV again you know I mean TV now there's so many different digital outlets maybe maybe a series maybe a series is the way to go well they had one before called Terminator Sarah Connor Chronicles and I loved that yeah. series uh, but I guess it wasn't what people were expecting they wanted more action it was more more of a drama yeah I also didn't hate it it wasn't a good movie but there was actually some entertaining parts in it I don't think it's Amelia Clark's fault I'm surprised I guess it must have been kind of a mutual separation though they must have been like look we, we don't know exactly what we're doing with this franchise anymore you can they released her from the con- I'm sure she signed up for like two or three and they probably released her and said look she probably said I I have all these other opportunities can I please go do them and they're like fine we don't we don't know it actually didn't do that bad worldwide Mm-mm. it made like over 400 million dollars I mean not a big blockbuster but considering how bad it did here it, it they, they might try and reboot it later on but yeah she wasn't the worst part of of the uh, Jai, Car- Jai Courtney I don't hate him like Christian does, <laughs> um, but I thought he was miscast in, in that role. So, all right, uh, what's next? Actually, it's buy or sell time. Yeah. What's next? A third movie in the Sherlock Holmes series from director Guy Ritchie has been in development for a long time with the three main players made up of Ritchie, Robert Downey Jr., and Jude Law, all saying they would return once they come up with a story worth telling. During an interview with the shortlist, Robert Downey Jr. revealed that movement is happening on Sherlock Holmes 3 at this very moment. He said, we're talking about it right now. 
now. I can't wait. I know Guy Ritchie loves me as much as I love him, and he damn well should. <laughs> when we're making those Sherlock movies, it is off the hook. We'll attempt to make one this year. It really is a big deal to go and do those movies. I'm tired all the time, but I'm excited about it. Clark, do you buy or sell Downey Jr.'s comments about making Sherlock Holmes 3 this year? I unenthusiastically buy it um, <laughs> because I think these movies are fine. Um, as I said, not 10 minutes ago, I want to see Downey doing different things, but he likes to hang out with Guy Ritchie. They are off the hook. So um, why not? But, uh, you know, I think also, though, what's interesting is it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how things have changed since the last um, the last one of these movies came out, because now we have Kingsman. We have um, not to say that's the same, obviously, but, um, you know, and then there was a stab at this um, old school um, British kind of thing with the man from Uncle. And so I don't know. I just wonder, like, I wonder if audiences are going to be as hungry for this. I would buy it. I, I just, for whatever reason, I like these movies. It's nothing I get geared up for. I don't plan my calendar around when a Sherlock Holmes movie is coming out, but I just was really entertained by the first two movies. So seeing Downey do something different that's not Iron Man, I know it's not like Oscar Beatty thing, but <laughs> he seems to have so much fun making these movies. So does Jude Law. So does Guy Ritchie directing it. So I, I, it's, it's, I, I'm like, I'm not thinking like, oh, what story are they going to tell? Who's going to be in it? Who's going to be the villain? Are we going to get, you know, it, it, another Mordecai? I just think it's going to be fun. So I can't do anything but buy it. I'm going to sell it. Uh, I, I actually like the first Sherlock Holmes. It wasn't amazing, but it was entertaining. But the second one just didn't interest me at all, so I, I didn't go see it. If they do make a third one, I will go back and watch the second one just to get ready for it. I, it's not, nothing against the movies, but I'm far more interested in the BBC Sherlock with Benedict Cumberbatch and Martin sure. Freeman. Mm -hmm. and, and this just, it, I don't know if he's going to do it, though. By, by the end of this year, I mean, he's pretty busy with Marvel movies and I'm sure he has other offers on the table as well but I know the studio would want to do it because they made a decent chunk of change for given their production all right what's next it appears that Warner Brothers is a little worried about the box office success of Disney's Jungle Book, so they've turned to one of their Oscar-winning directors to come in for some help. THR is reporting that Gravity director Alfonso Cuaron has just joined the Jungle Book as a consultant, with the article explaining that it's a Hollywood term that encompasses a lot of vague tasks, from assisting in directing to even post-production work. Director Andy Serkis has already completed principal photography on the motion capture film last year that stars the voices of of Christian Bale, Kate Blanchett, and Benedict Cumberbatch, with Circus himself playing Baloo. As Disney's Jungle Book continues to reign over the box office supreme, this report seems to, su to suggest that Warner Brothers is looking to complete their version as soon as possible. Dennis, do you buy or sell Alfonso Cuaron joining Jungle Book Oranges? Oranges. Uh, oranges. <laughs> King Louie so, loves oranges. Yeah. King Jungle Louis Book Oranges. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this movie for a long Damn time. It. I'm more of a banana guy. I yeah, gotta yeah, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna buy it with the right to sell it after the first trailer. Uh, I love Alfonso Cuaron. Him hopping on as consultant. At first, I thought it was a little weird, especially because they, they're they're done with shooting uh, principal photography. But we have to remember, this is a kind of a virtual character, virtual environment. They can easily go back and change stuff. So him coming on as a consultant post shooting isn't as strange to me anymore because they they can go back and maybe reshoot some performances change the tone of it i know i guess warner brothers was was going for a little darker jungle book and then they saw that disney actually already did that so i i feel bad for them because they've already invested a bunch of money they're gonna invest some more money and now they are up against something that people are loving clark yeah, this is a pickle or an orange <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I buy it. I buy uh, Curon. Oh, my God. Now it's a contagious <laughs> Curon. I buy him uh, coming on to the film. And also, I think that, um, look, Andy Serkis, I, I have no doubts that this movie will be fantastic when it's done. I think Andy Serkis is one of the most talented actors working today. This cast that he has assembled is fantastic, and I think he understands that mocap technology probably more than anybody at this point. So I think this movie will be beautiful. I think it will be heartfelt, um, and I think it will be it will be poignant. But I think that 
boy, you just could not have worse timing. I mean, and I wonder, I, you know, it's great that Alfonso is on board and I'm sure he will add some, some weight as well. But man, it's just kind of like, I don't know what you can do. Audience have, our, audiences have already spoken and they have already seen The Jungle Book. And I wonder if Favreau's version will be the definitive version. I buy Quran coming on. I sell my ability to understand how movies get made anymore because like this thing got pushed back a year from 2017, to 2018, but it's already been shot. We already shot the movie and now we're bringing on somebody else to help with a bunch of vague tasks that we don't really know what he's doing. He's just kind of chilling in the corner, smoking a cigar in the editing room, or maybe they're, they're, they're changing some story points. I think Quran's a fantastic filmmaker. So having him part of any movie is a credit to the production. As long as Andy Serkis is cool with it, because it seems from the start Andy Serkis was very hell-bent on getting his vision of the Jungle Book brought to life so as long as Karan is assisting that and it's not a studio meddling situation where Warner Brothers is like look we got to get this guy in here now you know because that's that's what was indicated to me when we reported that it had been pushed back a year is that there's some sort of problem or they just want to give it another year to let all the Jungle Book uh, the John Favreau version craze die down a little bit now maybe that's still the strategy I hope it is because I do want to see this version of the Jungle Book as well Karan, I think, could add a lot of interesting elements from a story production. Maybe just helping out Andy Serkis, who is, you know, it's the first time for him working on a production in this magnitude on a scale like this. So I think that it's all good signs for now. I'm just a little confused as to why we had to move the movie a year back. <laughs> We've already shot. I know there's a lot of post-production that goes on, but um, it's, I want to see this version now. All right. Uh, what's next? The Weinstein Company has released the first The Founder trailer starring Michael Keaton as Ray Krokrok, the savvy businessman who stole the idea from McDonald's and made his fortune on it. Directed by The, Bli the Blind Side and Saving Mr. Banks helmer John Lee Hancock, the film stars Michael Keaton as Ray along with Nick Offerman, Linda Cardellini, Laura Dern, BJ Novak, and John Carroll Lynch and opens in theaters on August 5th. Mark, do you buy or sell the new trailer for The Founder? Huge buy for me and true story. I watched it yesterday when I was in line where? at Taco Bell. Sorry, I cheated. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, th this trailer was everything I wanted to see. Like we've already pointed out on the show, Michael Keaton is in fact a G, and boy is he <laughs> one in this trailer. I love the way his storyline goes. I love that he runs into John Carroll Lynch and Nick Offerman the way that he does. Those guys are opening McDonald's. The history of McDonald's is fantastic. And believe me, kids, as somebody who spent a lot of time inside McDonald's, inside those golden arches, it's a fantastic backstory. I am really looking forward to this movie. Is he a G that eats a lot of oranges? <laughs> <laughs> He's very vitamin C heavy G. Uh, I'm going to buy this. I, I, I like this trailer a lot. It, I like the tone of it. Uh, John Lee Hancock, he directed Blindside and Saving Mr. Banks, which is kind of a little lighter fare. However, I want this movie to be a little more darker. And the fact that Robert Siegel wrote it makes me very excited because he wrote one of my favorite movies, The Wrestler. Mm. And he also mm. wrote and directed that movie, uh, what was it called? Big Fan, the one yeah, with Patton, Patton and Oswalt. So hopefully it goes towards that end versus, versus kind of a lighter blindside thing. Clark? Yeah, I think that I look. I was honestly really surprised when I saw the first poster for this movie. Um, I kind of rolled my eyes a little, and I was like, "Oh, I guess Michael Keaton wants his feel-good Oscar too," <laughs> um, especially considering John Lee Hancock directing. Um, and then I watched the trailer, and it and I kind of love this trailer because I love how it takes a turn and gets darker and darker, and then you're just like, by the end of it, I was kind of like, "Wow, I." do I like this guy? <laughs> and um, and that's good because I think that's what they're trying to do. And I am a huge fan of Michael Keaton as well. Um, as you guys know, I've talked about it a bunch, but I think this is playing to his strengths. You know, he plays characters that are left of center so well. And, uh, and I'm really, really excited. So yeah, and also as we were saying before we started rolling with John Carroll Lynch and Nick Offerman as these two guys who essentially get swindled, like you could not find two sweeter men <laughs> to, to screw over essentially. So I think that they're gonna stack the deck against him and I kinda like that. Yeah, watching this trailer, you're gonna go through the same emotions you will if you actually are eating at McDonald's where you start <laughs> out like really happy and oh, this is fun, we're all hanging out. Then it gets dark. Darker, it gets deeper, and then you start to hate yourself by the yeah, end of it. You start feeling sick. <laughs> if, if you guys could go to one fast food place for the rest of your life, that's all you can ever go to, what are you taking? Oh, I'm Chick going Chick fil A. Yeah, Chick fil A. Chick fil A. I'm going Wendy's. But Mickey D's is good. Good It's fries. hard for me because I have a gluten issue, and so I can't eat really oh. anything. But if I didn't have a gluten issue, mm -hmm. Chick fil A. 
Yeah. Yeah. Maybe In and Out. And then Wendy's is my second. I like love. Close. I mean, In and Out's probably my close second. But after a while, what, what else are you gonna eat? I don't All right. Know. Sorry, Burger King. Yeah, nobody picked you. <laughs> um, uh, Sinead, what did you think of the trailer? I loved it. Super good. I mean, yes, Michael Keaton is incredible. Um, and the whole story behind the the founding of McDonald's is so relevant. And it's so, it's so great. I'm surprised that a movie like this hasn't been made before because McDonald's is a part of pop culture even. And they're kind of like been in the news lately. I mean, I read last week that they're doing now like... Um, all you can eat fries and they did like their all day breakfast menu so they're like popping up again so it's like the perfect time for this movie to come out because they have a lot of oomph behind the business um, the whole story still kind of confuses me a little bit which makes me more excited when I see a trailer like this because it's like a good look into how it all started mm -hmm. I wonder if that all you can eat fry thing came from you know in like Japan they'll have like fry parties where they go and buy just a ton of french fries a group of people and they'll just throw them on the table oh my god i need to move to and japan they, and they just sit there and eat them it's either japan or korea i can't remember but they I actually wonder, call them fry parties yeah, yeah it's like a fry party it's like you get a bunch of your friends together go to mcdonald's and you buy as many french fries as possible and just throw them at the middle of the table do i have to bring my friends with me yeah, Mark, we, we've established that Mark Ellis does not like people. I, he doesn't I, like watching movies with people. He doesn't like no, eating with people. No. Quite frankly, he's pretty uh, disgusted with all of us just sitting here well, at this table. I want to go. I, if you don't eat any of the fries, sure. But like, I'm dumbing the fries on the table for me. That's my table of fries. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next? Oh, okay. Last year, Paramount created a writer's room to create a shared universe of Transformers movies led by Oscar winner Akiva Goldsman. Now the studio is creating the same process for a different franchise. Wait for it. The Hasbro Cinematic Universe. According to a report from THR, the new group of writers will create a series of interconnected films based on properties such as a rebooted, a rebooted G.I. Joe movie, Micronauts, Visionaries, and Mask. The writers leading the charge include Spider-Man 2 writer Michael Chabin, Why the Last Man creator Brian K. Vaughn, Captain Marvel screenwriter Nicole Perlman, showrunner for Marvel's Luke Cage, Chio Coker, and writers of the upcoming Spider-Man man homecoming movie john francis daly and jonathan goldstein clark do you buy or sell a hasbro cinematic universe i mean i <laughs> mark you look so excited this is better than the fry party i mean uh, i don't understand this like i just i was listening to you read this in very explicit detail and i was just like <laughs> i have no idea what the hell is going on like so no i sell this now i will say that uh, crew of talent that they have um, put together is great. Um, but no, I don't get it. So no, I sell it. And Mark? Oh, this is a huge buy for me, Dennis. <laughs> uh, look, G.I. Joe is something I grew up uh, playing way too much of, as with Mask. And look, if you can combine these things and make them a universe, not everything should be a cinematic shared universe, but this should be, okay? Let's be honest. The G.I. Joe movies are not great art on their own, and it's not going to be great art when you combine them in this world, but this is like an Independence Day feel for me. Like, let's just have all a crazy adventure together with all these things existing at the same time. Then we can have a fun team up. If you don't want to see it, guess what? You don't have to pay for a ticket to go check it out. This is something that I want to see. When I was a kid, I would occasionally cross breed. I would have I would have G.I. Joe's attack Mask, and Mask would be like, oh my god, these are the G.I. Joe guys. We should get their autograph. And then occasionally, the G.I. Joe's would attack Transformers and usually get their ass kicked because, guys, they're Transformers. So I think that if you can team them all up together and see who's taking whose side, this would be fantastic. Ten-year-old me loves this story, and 35-year-old me is a pretty big fan of it. <laughs> you only occasionally cross breed your figures i had mine like gi joe transformers all of them i took my sister's like strawberry shortcake figures and they would be like prisoners and uh, <laughs> nice. an elaborate storyline yeah but for me it's only a buy if the transformers universe and the gi joe universe cross over because i'm not sure yet because they have their own transformer shared universe that they're doing and they're having this hasbro one i don't know if they're they're crossing over because for me Transformers and G.I. Joe were huge and I always wanted in the cartoons for them to cross over I don't think that ever happened but I think it happened in the comic book so if they do it for live action 
I'm all for it, but I sell it if it's not. Right. I mean, you have properties like Mask or Micronauts or something like that where th those movies might do something on their own, but they would need the helping hand of a G.I. Joe or a Transformers to really bring them into prominence. So I think it can be done. And yeah, I mean, I'm just looking forward for, to, the, to the adventure of it. My sister used to steal my G.I. Joes and have them hook up with her Barbies, uh. and I was not a fan of that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, look, no more crossbreeding with anything. So that's why I was more of an isolationist. And I'm with Clark with the writers. I actually like this this crew of writers, especially Brian K. Vaughn, uh, who wrote uh, Why the Last Man. He, he's writing one of the fav my favorite comics right now, Saga. He also wrote a lot of stuff for Lost. And so uh, I, I'm interested in it, but I just want to see... I really want to see if Transformers and G.I. Joe, those are the two big ones. I mean, we also loved all those names in the writer's room for trans for the new Transformers. Yeah. Then we hear Michael Bay is coming back, and it's like, oh, okay, he's just going to do whatever the hell he wants. But if we can keep these guys' ideas, I think you could have a lot of cool stuff in there. All right, all right guys, now on to our weekly, weekly segment, Box Office Predictions. This is where we try and predict the top five movies of this weekend. It's brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Uh, Mark... What are your top five for this oh, week? Oh, man, Dennis, this is a tough one because, unfortunately, I saw a Huntsman Winter's War, and um, I think this is going to be one of the biggest bombs of the year. I oh, hate really? saying that. I root for movies to do well, but when I see a movie and you're, you're taking people's hard-earned money, you shouldn't go see The Huntsman. It's not, it's not worth it. It's not a good movie on any level. So I think that The Jungle Book is going to remain comfortably at number one. I do think that Huntsman Winter's War will come in at number two. Um, at number three, that's where it gets tricky because I know that we have, uh, it's, there's nothing else really in wide release coming out this weekend. So I think I will stick with Barbershop at three. I'm going to go with Batman v Superman at four. And then we're going to put the boss at number five. Clark? Um, well, I'm going to do everything exactly what mark did except switch the boss and batman v superman so i think the boss is going to be at four <laughs> i keep putting batman v because they're so close every week i keep <laughs> putting batman v superman I'm like no this is the week it overtakes the boss but <laughs> no i think i think batman v superman is going to be at number five which is fun because i've been calling it batman five superman anyway that's a roman numeral <laughs> joke <laughs> for any of you guys <laughs> Anyway. Well, I think I have the same top three. I have Jungle Book number one, Huntsman number two, uh, Barbershop next cut number three. However, I have The Boss at number four and I have Zootopia at number five. Ooh. Batman v Superman let me down last week and didn't didn't overtake the boss so I, I, I'm, I'm kicking it out of my top five Melissa I love that poster because it looks like Melissa McCarthy knows that she's beating Batman v Superman yeah. every week by like half a million dollars it's hilarious <laughs> all right guys now we're on to mailbag before that I want to remind you we're taking your live Twitter questions you can tweet us at Collider video and we'll take a uh, Sinead will pick out a few for after mailbag also remember to send in your email questions at uh, Collider video at gmail.com you know, we called out for more diverse questions earlier in the week, and we, we got a lot of good ones. We're, we're going to have mailbag this weekend, and you'll, you, you guys will see those. Uh, for now, what's the first one? Kania Williams writes, hey, CMT, that trailer for Born was born-tastic, and I'm glad Matt and Paul are back. So I take it no one really liked the last Bourne film with Jeremy Renner. I'm probably the only one that enjoyed it for what it is. However, I really did like Aaron Cross and Renner's performance. Did you agree as well? If they decide to do another Bourne film, whether it's the last of the franchise or not, with Matt and Paul still attached, would you be fine with Renner reprising his role and maybe teaming up with Jason? I actually also am with him. I actually was entertained by the last one with Jeremy Renner. I didn't think it was as good as any of the ones with Matt Damon, but I didn't think it was a bad movie. I think if it was a movie that wasn't called Born, I think a lot more people would be less harsh on it. So I, I don't mind if, if, if this next one does well and Matt Damon and Paul Greengrass decide to come back, I'm all for Jeremy Renner coming back and teaming up with him. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it if they're fine with it. You know, it seemed like Matt Damon wasn't a huge fan that they were making a Bourne movie without him. So if he's softened his stance on that, I am totally cool with that. I really like the Jeremy Renner Bourne movie. Can I remember the name of it? No, but I know it had Bourne in the title. <laughs> Bourne and Legacy. The Bourne Legacy. And it was good, man. It was a really fun action-adventure movie. I thought it had a lot of nice elements to it. It wasn't as good as the Bourne trilogy. And this new Jason Bourne movie just, oh, my God, it looks so good. Jason Bourne looks like me at a movie theater. He just wants to be by himself. So I can't imagine <laughs> that he would at, at, somehow after this adventure, when he knows who his name is now, hey, I, I remember some stuff. I can't imagine he's going to want to team up with anybody, like ever, in a movie. 
It just it does not seem to be his style, you know? He's going to hang out with, like, Julia Stiles for a minute, mm. and then she'll probably get killed. And then he'll <laughs> hang out with somebody else. Because women don't do well in those... If you're hanging out with Jason Bourne, get the hell out of Dodge, <laughs> because you're probably not making it out of the movie alive. I don't see him teaming up with anybody else ever, though I did dig the Renner one. Clark? Well, fun fact, I've actually never seen a Jason Bourne movie what? all the way through. What? Yep. What? I know. Shock. See, women do not do well when they're hanging out with Jason Bourne. <laughs> it's Ford. true. We just leave. I watched the first one or started it uh, on TV or something, and then I was like, meh. Uh, so I, I'm not being dismissive, and I'm not hating on these movies. I'm sure if I sat down and watched from start to finish, I would love it. But with that being said, um, just from a financial perspective, looking at this franchise, I think they tried to extend the franchise out. It clearly didn't work. Um, but isn't Jer Jeremy Renner is in the Mission Impossible movies too yes, now, right? Yeah. I think he is doing really, really well. I love him in those movies. I, I'm loving those movies the more, uh, the further along we get, and especially now that Macquarie is, um, you know, involved in the way that he is. So I think uh, Jeremy Renner is going to be fine. He has a couple of action franchises going. Um, and uh, but yeah. I mean, you know, from everything that I can tell, I don't think that they're going to give the keys to the castle uh, to Renner and for the Bourne franchise anytime soon. But I think with the Jeremy Renner thing, it's it's kind of like always the bridesmaid, not the bride, because he was supposed to take over for the Bourne yeah. franchise. He was supposed to take over for the Mission Impossible franchise. And e even in Avengers, his character is a side character. Yeah. He's not leading any of these. I like Jeremy Renner a lot. I, I think he'd do great, but I, he just hasn't gotten... Maybe that connection with the audience. Yeah. He just needs a chance to start, man. He's like Aaron Rodgers. He just the guy in front of him just won't retire. So he's like, No, I, I want a chance. I want to climb at the top of the building. It's like, no, nah, you just hang out while Tom Cruise does it, you know? So which I'm not complaining about, but yeah, he'll get plenty of shots in the future. I just don't think the born one is for him. Yeah. Okay. All right, what's the last mailbag? Tashri Hugo writes, Hey Collider Crew, huge fan of the show, sending you guys love all the way from South Africa. My question has to do with controversial films. Two part question. One, what are some of your favorite controversial films? Two, why do you think studios take a huge gamble making these films? Some of my favorite controversial films are The Da Vinci Code, JFK, Green Zone, Monty Python's Life of Brian, and Antichrist. All underrated, in my opinion. These films cause huge uproar upon release. Thanks, and keep up the good work. Clark, what are some of your well, favorite controversial films? as you all know, I am a big horror fan, and mm -hmm. so is Mark Ellis. Uh, so um, a couple of minor genre films. I love Wes Craven's Last House on the Left. Um, very controversial, even now. Um, and uh, I, I just think he handles that material with, with great care. Um, whereas something like I Spit on Your Grave or Day of the Woman is something that I've never been able to get through. I just don't have the desire. Um, but uh, The Exorcist was very controversial. Silence of the Lambs, of course. Um, and uh, you know, I, yeah, so those are a couple of the ones that I like the best. Uh, I saw I Spit on Your Grave, and that's a tough the one. The original? Yeah, the original. The original. It's tough to watch. Because there are some people who are like, oh, I've seen the remake, and I'm like, no, 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 Very different. Yes. Uh, Mark? Uh, I I don't seek out controversial movies all that much for whatever reason. Like, I remember when kids came out, yeah. and I was a kid, and I was like, oh, man, I should probably check that out at some point. And there was a huge controversy over that movie. Passion of the Christ, obviously, is something that, you know, really is going to affect people based on how you feel about certain things. Most of the controversial movies that I watch are documentaries, mm -hmm. and I don't necessarily think I need to go into details to what they are, but you can find them on YouTube about any subject you want, and man, will it make you think. Type in any sort of huge tragic event or even like the JFK assassination I watched I've literally watched like 50 documentaries about that with all different theories about what went down that day and the events leading up to it and it's just madness if you want to go down the rabbit hole it's maybe the biggest one you can fall through you know what else I like is um, I liked spring breakers a lot and that was very controversial um, when it came out mm -hmm. but I I really liked that movie I was surprised how much I liked it for me it's a movie that was I guess semi-controversial when it came out it's a darren aronofsky's noah it's it's a film that all the people who are super religious hated but on the opposite spectrum all the atheists hated i i personally <laughs> am agnostic so for me i i felt like it was kind of like a almost like a fantasy post-apocalyptic fable along the lines of some of the greek god stories so I actually really like that, but uh, I just know some people on both sides that just absolutely hated it. Where do you guys stand on Kubrick? Because uh, he's made some pretty, like Clockwork Orange, for oh, instance. Oh, I, I love right. Clockwork Orange. That's a movie that 
I have seen a handful of times, and I can't deny how good it is, but it doesn't mean I don't like it. It doesn't mean I like it. Oh, like, really? I don't I enjoy lo- watching Clockwork I love Orange. it, but it's tough to watch. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of movies like that. Like, I love The Wrestler, and that's tough to watch as well. Or Irreversible. Have you guys seen that movie? I've not seen Irreversible, no, but, but I, everyone it's, mentions it. It's, when uh, it's, when I had laser eye sur- I had LASIK done, uh, <laughs> w- like, right after college, I think, and uh, the doctor, had, like, they put a clamp on your eye. So the first thing he asked me is, like, have you ever seen a Clockwork Orange? And I was like, at the time, I hadn't seen it yet. And I was like, no, but I know what happened. <laughs> He's like, okay, we'll try not to think about it then. Uh, oh, have you ever seen a Clockwork Orange? This is going to be just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know that hor- that movie yeah. where horrible things happen to people? <laughs> Never yeah. a Just good a- way to start. That was his, that was his last uh, surgery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for Mailbag. Now on to your live Twitter questions. Reminder, you can tweet us at Collider Video. Uh, Sinead, what do we got up first? Bazinga Guy tweets, has a studio ever not made a sequel because of critics or fans' reactions, or does money always talk? Yeah, people, they have for sure canned stuff. Didn't that just happen? Fantastic Four yeah uh, but i mean that was such a dud financially yeah. too that and a lot of reason yeah. why it was a dud financially is because of the word of mouth both with audiences and critics were so bad so usually one has an effect on the other one it's hard to think of a movie that did so well in the theaters that people didn't like that they're like ah we're not going to make a sequel like i think like like you look at something like transformers which audiences clearly go to see but critics despise those movies and they keep churning them out as fast as they possibly can well, I, I would say Amazing Spider-Man 2 might fall into that category mm-hmm. because it's a movie that actually made money. Right. It was profitable, but it was had a lukewarm reception from both the audience and the critics, and that's kind of that's how that Marvel deal came about. And sometimes it's just a legacy thing where you not only have to live up to audience expectations and make a lot of money, but you also have to live up to your previous films. So when you look at something like Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, yes, they're going to be making another one, and it's going to come out in 2019, but they would have been making more of those movies if people loved those, that movie like they loved the first three. All right, what's next? Caitlin Torta tweets, since Keaton is out for Spider-Man, do you think the villain will still be Vulture as rumored or could it be somebody else? I think it will still be just because they're shooting in June. It's it's coming up real quick. So if they don't have their script squared away, they're kind of in trouble. Also, they've been trying to make Vulture a villain, a movie, Spider-Man movie with Vulture for a while. I think that was the rumored Spider-Man 4, Sam Raimi's film um, that got canned. I think he was one of the main villains, if not the main villain, and John Malkovich was attached at the time. Yeah, I think at this point it would be such the wrong play, the wrong move in the public eyes too for Sony to be like, oh, yeah, you know what? Okay, now that Michael Keaton doesn't want to be the Vulture, now let's just do Venom. Like, you, you, this, this is the horse you're riding, so stay on it. You're going to find a great actor to replace Michael Keaton. Tons of people would kill to be Vulture in a movie of this size and magnitude. So, yeah, it's still going to be Vulture. All right, what's next? Steve tweets, what is happening with the upcoming Texas Chainsaw Massacre prequel? Is it still coming out this year? Leatherface, yeah. Um, I, I, th- I think that I've been reading, uh, Bloody Disgusting, I think, was reporting that uh, the tests have been going well, like test screenings. Um, I think they've already got a cut. I'm not sure, because I haven't seen it, but um, there's a lot of anticipation for this movie. I mean, those writer-directors who also made a very controversial movie, speaking of controversial, Mm -hmm. uh, Inside, a very bloody French horror movie, which I do not love, but everybody else does. Um, They are, yeah, they're the ones behind it. And also, there's a lot of mystery. Like, do you guys know, because basically what we know is that this movie takes place revolving around a handful of kids or teenagers, and they one of them grows up to be Leatherface, but we don't know who. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's a cool spin on because I, I was not a fan of the most recent Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. I, I just didn't like the way that the story tried to portray Leatherface ultimately. Like, I get what they were going for. It just didn't work for me as a fan. I think that could be something very interesting where if you if you give me just Leatherface again, I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. But if you inject an element of 1985's Clue in there, <laughs> totally on board. Yeah, it's an origin story in a lot of ways, but actually, and usually I'm anti-origin story, but this is kind of interesting because I would like to, as a 
fan like to dive into that crazy family and the history of that family. But yeah, if you do a little digging online, if you're curious, you can easily find the synopsis um, for Leatherface. And it's interesting, but they don't tell you. And the cast is really good, too. But they don't tell you who is Leatherface. And they've already been screening it, you said? Or they've had like test screenings? I am under the impression that Bloody Disgusting has heard or they've reported that someone has seen it and the feedback was good. Um, Because, yeah, I do think that they're looking to put it out later this year. Maybe like a Halloween kind of thing. So Maybe. All right, what's next? DeAndre A. tweets, do all films and theaters have red carpet premieres or do some films like Fifty Shades of Black just release it without a premiere? Fifty Shades of Black is going to have a... Oh, Fifty Shades of Black. I yeah. Not great. No, yeah. it did I have was a like, pre- wait a second. Fifty Shades of Black had a premiere. Yeah. I, I think that, that like, you'll be, especially because we live in L.A., you're going to see premieres for movies just like walking down the street at a local movie theater and you're going to have no idea what the hell the movie is. Like, Virtually every movie that comes out has some sort of premiere. It's just a matter of what the scale is, if there's any news media actually covering it, or if there's just their friends with their iPhones taking pictures. There's mm-hmm. sometimes not even a red carpet, but yeah, every movie has some sort of premiere, you gotta think, right? Yeah, even the small ones, they'll they'll get a theater, a smaller theater, and they'll they'll do it. Even like independent films that people make, they'll have it just for them and their friends yeah. and invite it. So it, it, yeah, you're, t- you're talking about different scales, but almost everything has one. And a lot of times they'll do a premiere screening, so it doesn't have to be the entire theater, but usually there'll be a Q&A afterwards, audience or um, directors, talent, whoever will be there. And, and it's usually just for friends and family, but it's a good way to get your name out there. All right. You have another one? Yep. Um, here we go. Devonte tweets, "What makes a good scary movie?" Clark, why don't you answer that? Well, one? I'm curious what you guys uh, would say. I mean, for me, it's just tension. That's why I don't like. I, I don't like that. That was at the Halloween remake that Rob Zombie did. Yeah. yeah. Like to me, there's no tension in that, right? It's just like a guy going around killing, you know, slacking people blood and guts and I, for me it's all about tension that's why i was a big fan of the witch mm-hmm. i thought there was a lot of tension in that movie and f- so that's what kind of freaks me out and creeps me out clowns <laughs> make great horror movies <laughs> um i i really like mystery in horror movies like i don't like the big reveal happening too early i don't really like seeing what exactly is causing all this disruption now sure it's fun when you're into the friday the 13th 6th and 7th and 8th and nightmare on elm street's four and five and freddy's you know dead all that stuff it's like it's yeah we know who we're getting with this it's gonna crack some jokes kill some kids and we're all gonna have a, a barrel of laughs but usually i like seeing stuff like like in the shadows you can't really tell what it is i like i like the movie creeping up on you that's one of the reasons why i like the witch so much even though it didn't have a lot of jump scares and i have no problem with jump scares i'm a big fan of them actually but it didn't need those things it slowly built up to this fever pitch where you're so tense by the end of it that's why i dig those kind of movies there's a movie coming out uh later this year called lights out and i think i've talked about it on movie talk before and it's just one of those things where it's got such a great hook i also like that in horror movies when they know that they have you they hook you like the conjuring had just the had the hands clapping, and, and that was a great hook. The hook in Lights Out is one of the best ones I've ever seen. I hope it carries through to the feature film, because the short on YouTube you can watch right now is one of the scariest things you'll ever see. The trailer's see. out, too, and you interviewed the director at WonderCon. David, uh, yeah, David Sandberg, yeah. He, he's a great dude. He's It's under James Wan's production company. James Wan discovered him through this film festival, and then he uh, he gave the green light to make the, the full-length film, and Sandberg seems very excited about it. He seems very level-headed about the movie coming out. It's a summertime horror movie. I think people are going to go crazy for yeah, it. Yeah, that one actually has, I can tell you for sure, has been testing through mm-hmm. the roof. Like, people are losing their mind over how good it is, which is why it got I'm that. I'm losing my mind yeah. in my apartment when <laughs> I get up to get some water at 3 a.m. by myself. Like, I think I'm seeing things when maybe they're there. I well, don't know. Well, and clearly Warner Brothers has a lot of faith in it because, and I've said this on the show before, they gave it a mid-July release date, which is a huge thing. Um, for me, what makes a good horror movie are the characters. Honestly, if you don't care about the characters, there's no stakes. Um, I mean, Sure, there's something to be said for slasher movies where, you know, you're there for the spectacle, you're there for Jason, you're there for Michael, whatever. But for me, the things that make horror movies last forever and the things that make them still scary to this day are just great stories about character um, and relationships. And then scary things just happen to happen in the background. Right. Yeah. It's fun to go in sometimes and root for the villain, like if it's Freddy or Jason. But like I ain't rooting for Satan in The Exorcist. (laughs) Like I feel horrible these things are happening and I want to get through it as quickly as possible. Sinead, what makes scary movies good 
Scary movie's good for you. Um, well, I definitely agree with you. Characters and a solid plot. Like, the cheesy horror plot needs to stop. But for me, one of the biggest things that gets me hooked into a scary movie is the tone of it. Like, if they set it up as a scary movie from the very beginning, like, the first shot should be creepy. It should be it should be tense. There should be some mystery. And then I'm, I'm usually good. When a movie starts and it's kind of, like, a little weird and it gets scary, it's harder for me to get into it. Mm. And a creepy piano helps. Yeah, you got a creepy piano in there, man. I'm on. All right, let's do two more. All right, Donald tweets, how long do you all think an actor should stay with one franchise before moving on to other things? Mm. Depends on the franchise. If it's Robert Downey Jr., forever. <laughs> Hugh Jackman, forever. <laughs> but sometimes there's other ones you're like, uh, yeah, just get out of there. You know? It doesn't seem like the logic is always like the, the first two are the, the first one's great. The second one is, yeah, it's a lot. And then the third one's terrible. And then that's when we ditch the character. Yeah. Like, I, I, maybe I'm just going by the Beverly Hills cop rule <laughs> of being in a franchise, but it seems to be the third movie when the wheels tend to come off, unless it's some weird outlier like the Avengers. You know, that's, I, I'd say the third movie is when you kind of. Uh, well, I like the idea of, like, to use the Avengers as an example, I like the idea that certain characters have bigger roles in certain movies, and then some of them just show up for a real fast in other movies. Mm -hmm. And I think that allows the character to be fresh and allows the character to be interesting. And I would imagine for the actor allows it to be interesting as well because they're in so many different circumstances and situations as opposed to I'm playing the same character with the same mission for four movies or six movies. All right, last one. Craig tweets, do you think these new 4DX theaters are going too far with moving seats, wind, smells, etc.? Signs of youth needing more. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with this, but anything that has smells in it, like that just sounds like a recipe for disaster. It's like you... that ride at Disneyland. What's it called? It's like Soren. Soren. And they like you you basically like fly over California and you can like smell the oranges and the palm oh, trees. Oranges. So so if there's like a dark, dingy alley, like yeah, like, like Megan Fox talked about that in uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the the one they just shot about that alley. And she's like, oh yeah, that's the place where everyone goes to pee. Oh yeah. <laughs> are, are we gonna like have the smell of that? I, I I just I'm not for that. It's great. Finally, you can pass gas in a movie theater. Nobody's gonna know it's you. <laughs> no, that's just the movie theater. It's just uh, that's just the way they build it up. I gotta be on board for that. We were talking about horror movies. Like it might, it might be fun if you're seeing like a creepy shot of the woods you know and then like you just get like a breeze and and it gets a little bit colder in the theater that could be that that could be kind of I'm, I'm in for horror movies uh yeah i don't need this no i don't i'm, Damn I'm it, not Clark. i'm sorry i paid 20 dollars can for these you just tickets. like imagine it's like remember back in the day where you if you walked into a mall you could smell abercrombie from like this time you walked in because they would like <laughs> pump the Abercrombie spray into the vents. Like, can you just imagine what that would take to make a movie? Like just pumping like pee smells and like food smells into like the air conditioner <laughs> at the movie theater? Who's the, the poor guy that? saddled with? Hey, Johnson, we need to go pee. <laughs> we got theater five is about to have the pee scene. We need to go pee. I like how this is where this went. Like it yes. didn't go to a field of flowers or anything nah, like that. I took it, it to fart to jokes pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. Got me. yeah, and we're probably like way wrong or like over the top with it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, I'm all set. I don't need this. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not for it. So, Ellis, you're the I'm only one. Totally Ellis in, is the only one down for yeah, it. Yeah, you know what? I'll do it at my place when you come over to watch Screening Room <laughs> with me. We'll set it up. We'll have a horror movie. I'll have some fans there. I'll have a couple dudes with, with palm trees. <laughs> it's going to be a, a, an all inclusive movie going experience. Yeah. Yes, uh, I will not be attending that. Fine. You're not invited okay. anyway. No fry party for Dennis. No. <laughs> all right, guys, that's it for today's episode of Collider Movie Talk. I want to thank the people joining us at the table today. Clark, where can people find you? You can find me on the interwebs at Clark Wolf. Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and on YouTube.com slash official Clark Wolf. Uh, Mark? Uh, Schmodown later on today, the movie trivia Schmodown, and then you can find me at Mark Ellis Live on Twitter. Upcoming tour dates include Albany, New York, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Houston, Texas. Get your tickets at my website, MarkEllisLive.com. Uh, Sinead, where can people find you? I'm on Instagram and Twitter at Sinead DeFries and at ThatSoShinead.com. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero, on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. want to remind you, yeah, the Schmodown is today. Finstock versus Schnepp. That's going down at 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, also, we did a return of the Jedi commentary that Ellis, Campia, and who was the third person? Schnepp, Schnepp was there. Yeah. Who got emotional first? You probably bet who? You. 
It might have been me. Yeah. <laughs> well, tears in me. your eyes. The, the was it the Ewoks? It was the Ewoks? The, yeah, the Ewok, he, he bites it, and his friend, instead of running away from the, the ATST danger. walker, he just lays on top of his friend because he'd rather die in the forest with his buddy than continue on without him. God, it brings a tear to my eye. <laughs> and you guys, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash Collider Videos. And check out Mailbag this weekend. If not, we'll see you guys on Monday. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.